proposed select stages of attachment that would happen in the developmental cycle in our early lifespan. He described four such stages. In stage one, this was considered indiscriminate social responsiveness. This is when a baby is a newborn to about two months of age. In this stage, babies are learning that they can impact their environment through crying and through smiling. They start off crying not as a means to an end, not instrumentally, it's just purely a reaction. But then they start to learn that crying is associated with certain behaviors from their parents. Crying may allow the parents to approach them or pick them up. And they also might find that smiling allows for the parent to spend more time with them or to talk to them more. So babies are very smart and in those first two months of life when it seems like they're not doing much besides pooping and sleeping, they're actually learning how they can impact their environment. They don't have any social preferences at this point. Uh, they don't really have a preference for which caregiver and at this age you can really pass a baby around the room and they don't react to strangers very heavily. But they do like that they can get the responses they require from their environment through crying or cooing or smiling. According to John Bowlby, stage two is the discriminate sociability stage. And this starts to happen around two months of age and goes to about seven months of age, though there is some individual variance in there. And in this stage, this is when babies start to recognize familiar people. So they might see their parents or their grandparents that they see a lot of the time, and they may anticipate them and smile more. Uh, they may be able to anticipate what the person's going to do if they have a certain way of moving or a certain way of talking around the infant. So they start to recognize people and they start to recognize people to the extent that they may stop crying when they anticipate that person's going to fill their needs. They spent the first stage of recognizing the pattern and now they can use it. This is the idea that the infant may be crying in their crib until the parent's footsteps can be heard approaching the, the nursery. And so once they hear the parent's footsteps, they may cease crying. And it's not that they no longer need you, it's that they hear you and they know you're going to come and help them out with whatever they need. And so you can't spoil a baby at this stage. This baby's still too young to spoil. Uh, they're not trying to manipulate you in any evil way, uh, but they are starting to form patterns and they are starting uh, to anticipate that you'll be there to meet their needs. And meeting their needs helps them to feel a little bit more secure in their environment. And so they start to recognize some rules of the universe here. They start to recognize the rule of reciprocity. Uh, babies really like it when they're, if they're making eye contact with the parent and the parent responds in a reciprocal way. That is if the baby smiles and the parent smiles, or if the baby sticks their tongue out and the parent sticks their tongue out, or if the baby makes a disgusted face and the parent makes a disgusted face. Uh, this reciprocity allows them to understand that they're being validated, they're being heard, uh, and that the parent gets them. We've seen through clinical studies that if parents and infants go to the lab and a parent is trained to not respond to infants, this, this can be a little bit tricky because you want to smile back to your baby when they smile, but if a parent is trained not to, the baby becomes very confused and very upset. Uh, if, they, if they try and do what we call an emotional bid and they try and show an angry face and the parent's not showing an angry face back and not getting it, uh, they can become very upset. Versus when the parent does reciprocate and respond in the same way, the baby tends to be very happy uh, and enjoys this, and this is their way of communicating at this age. The second rule is the rule of effectiveness, and this is the idea that goes beyond just smiling and crying impacts the environment. Now we get to more specific behaviors, like dropping an object will get someone to pick up the object or making a loud bang will make someone come and say a certain word. At this age, babies may start to learn uh, meanings of words like no or yes, uh, so they're not able to speak the words yet, but they can start to recognize their name, they can start to recognize when they do certain things, people around them will respond in a specific way rather than responding in a more general way, which they understood in stage one. And the last thing I wanna bring up is the idea of trust. As mentioned, you can't spoil a baby at this age, it's good to respond to their needs as soon as you're safely able to respond to their needs. And allowing that to happen teaches the infant they can rely on their caregiver, that their needs are going to be met and they are safe and they are secure. The third stage of John Bowlby's theory was the specific, enduring, and effective bonds. This is what we typically think of when we think of infant parent attachment. And so this is somewhere between seven months and 24 months. Uh, some studies have found that it may peak as early as nine months or it may peak around 14 months, but this is the really intense period. So this is when uh, mo most parents will notice the protest cry. So the protest cry comes out when an infant is aware that their caregiver is leaving or has just left. Now this is a different type of cry than their anger cry or their pain cry but it's still a very enduring cry and it can still be a very upsetting cry for caregivers. 
And there's a reason behind that. The infant does not want the caregiver to leave and they are going to protest as hard as they can to convince that caregiver that it's not worth leaving. And so it's because the infant does not quite know what's happening. Cognitively, what's going on at this time, infants are aware their caregiver is leaving, but isn't sure where their caregiver is going. They're not sure if they'll ever be back. This is like, if you think about a puppy dog and they don't know where their owner is, they don't know when you'll be back, it can be really upsetting to them. And so this is something that's very devastating to babies. And so that's why they sound so devastated and that's why it can be so heartbreaking. We know that parents have to leave sometimes, whether you're just going to the washroom, the laundry room, or you know, you have a legitimate reason for leaving. Uh, the infants become very upset. So this is particularly, research has shown that the mother-child bond um, gets really intense at this time. And a lot of mothers uh, have stories of where they really had somewhere they had to go, but their infant cried so much, it was very, very heartbreaking to them. And if you look at the age, seven to 24 months, uh, this is the age where many Canadian moms will be entering the workforce again after the maternity leave. And so this is when you drop your infant off at daycare for the very first time, and they do a massive protest cry. Uh, it's very enduring, it's very painful. You get filled with guilt. You think, oh no, maybe they can't do this. Maybe I shouldn't put them in daycare. Uh, it's really, really difficult. It's something that uh, most of us have to go through and it does seem to be developmentally typical and once the infant gets to a different cognitive stage they're going to be okay with this uh, you're not going to scare them as long as they're in a safe high quality daycare uh, but it can be very exhausting to the parent combining with this to make it a little bit more exhausting is the fact that the infants have now reached an age where they can locomote so their ability for locomotion has kicked into high gear some of them may be crawling some of them may be creeping some of them may be rolling or scooting and once we get a little bit older they may be walking or full-on walking of course and so because of this they can walk to the caregiver if they are close enough and so parents find if you're just doing something around the home perhaps you just want to go take a nap while another caregiver takes care of the baby they can crawl to the bedroom and protest cry right to your face or perhaps you just need to hop in the shower and if you have one of those showers with the clear glass walls you may find that the infant creeps into the bathroom presses their face against the shower door and cries at you um, I may have experienced that myself. It's not so much of a stress-free shower at that point. But finally, we get beyond that really enduring stage three and we move to what John Bowlby called stage four, goal-corrected partnerships. And in goal-corrected partnerships, this happens somewhere around 24 months or just beyond 24 months, and thankfully it continues on. And this is the idea that infants start to get it. They understand that the relationship they have with their caregiver is sustainable and it's not going to end just because the caregiver disappears temporarily and so it's the idea that they understand they have a close relationship with their parent even when their parents not physically present that they can still feel secure and so there's some signs of this this is when infants start to initiate more uh, interactivity with people beyond the primary caregiver this is the idea when there's other people in your home they're not just talking with the primary caregiver going up and getting their attention they're also going up to other people a little bit more in addition they require receiving less attention from the primary caregiver kids always want attention no matter how old they are but they start to receive a little bit less they could maybe play with some toys for a little bit or they're okay playing with other objects or other people in the home rather than the primary caregiver and they also start to tolerate the distance and separation and this is when they start to form an internal working model about what relationships are According to Horne and, and Klein, this is the idea of that object relations theory is starting to be okay. We understand the relationship, we understand the schema for a relationship, even when the caregiver or the parent is not present. So thankfully, when we get to this stage, things become a little bit more relaxed. The parent-child bond is still gonna be very intense at 24 months, but it's less intense than it was at perhaps nine to 14 months. And so there's a little bit more flexibility there. Uh, the infant starts to be more interested in the relationships at daycare or the relationships with other animals or other children, and they give the parent a little bit more freedom and a little bit more flexibility.